Hey guys, Derek here with Tap and Turn Gaming, and I'm here today with part two of my Marinar EDH deck tech. So the general is Marinar. He is a five cost, two, three rat rogue. Um, I really like him. I built this as a tribal rat deck, as you probably saw from part one, but I'll rehash my general. He's a five cost, two, three rat rogue, mono black. Uh, he gives all your rats fear, which is pretty important since I have a tribal rat deck. And he has the ability to tap and sacrifice a rat to put X11 rat creature tokens into play where X is the remaining number of rats you control. So if I have three rats down, I tap him, sacrifice one, I go to two. I put two rats into play, now I have four. Next turn I tap him again, sacrifice from those four, I go down to three, put in three, now I have six. More or less how he works. Then I have my cool little custom rat tokens here that I made. I like them a lot, nothing really crazy, just some... Uh, you know, custom rat tokens, pretty cool stuff. No big deal. Put my general off to the side so we can talk about the cards of the deck. Uh, so what I'm going to do for this part two deck tech is I'm sort of going to skip over some of the categories that I don't really need to talk about. Uh, for instance, my basic lands. Well, they're basic lands, so I don't really need to talk about the basic lands. So I'll just put those off to the side. I run a few tutors. Demonic Tutor, Diabolic Tutor... Demonic Collusion, Increasing Ambition, and Diabolic Revelation. Again, they're just tutors. They do what they do. I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, this is my package of sweepers. I, I'm sort of heavy on the sweepers. I really like it. Uh, it sort of goes with the theme of the deck where rats just sort of eat everything in their path. So I figured a lot of sweepers are sort of on theme. But we run Living End, Living Death, Life's Finale, Extinguish All Hope, Decree of Pain, In Garrick's Wake, and my ugly white bordered plague wind. So if anybody wants to send me a black water plague wind, I'd be more than happy to take it and I'll send you my white bordered, you know, if you're into that kind of thing. But yeah, <laughs> these are my sweepers. That's what I run. So those are some categories I don't really need to talk about. There's not really a lot going on there. Next category up would be the enchantments. I run Oversold Cemetery. Um, I personally feel like this is a staple in any black deck. It only has the one black in the casting cost and only costs two mana to put down. And this thing is a powerhouse. You know, it's it's very underrated, I think. I don't, I don't think enough people run it for what it does. But the way it works is as long as you have four creatures in your graveyard, at the beginning of your upkeep, you can take one of them back to your hand. Being able to get your creatures back is huge. And being able to do it for free every turn, I, I don't see why more people don't run this card. And then I run both Dictate of Erebos and another ugly white bordered card, my Grave Pact. Uh, more or less the same card. Four cost when I lose a creature, everybody loses a creature. And a five cost when I lose a creature, everybody loses a creature. Just has flash. So they're in there for that reason since I'm going to be sacrificing some creatures. Um, now I'm going to go on to my Sorceries and Instants. I actually don't think I run any Instants. I think they're all Sorceries. Yeah, they are. So first off, I have Lab Rats. I think this is a nice little token producer, a little janky, but that's okay. Th this deck is a little janky on its own since it's tribal rats. There's not a lot of great rats, but Lab Rats is a one-cost black sorcery with buyback four, and it puts a 1-1 one -one rat token into play. No big deal, but the fact that I can buy it back for five is pretty nice. So then, you know, late game when I have 10, 15 mana laying around and I have nothing else to cast, I can cast it once or twice and just get a couple blockers in or more rats to fuel Marinar a little more. Profane Command, very used card, very well-known card, uh, has some great modes. Target player loses X life or return to our creature card from uh, with converted mana cost X or less from your graveyard to play. Or target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. Or up to X target creatures gain fear until end of turn. All of these modes are relevant. This is one of the, the few of the command cards where every single mode is relevant. Being able to res, being able to kill, being able to make you guys nearly unblockable, being able to make someone lose life. A lot of times I will use the target opponent loses uh, target player loses X life in the uh, my creatures gain fear for a sort of a one two punch to try to win. Next card I run is Patriarch's bidding. Uh, I think it's also a pretty well known card, but it's pretty much a staple in any black tribal deck or any tribal deck that's running black. Five cost sorcery. When you cast this, you call a creature type. <laughs> Excuse me, and you res all creatures of that type from the graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, it's very nice. The only downfall to this card is that each opponent gets to do it as well. But that's sort of the drawback you take. Um, it's not a huge deal 
that the opponent's rising creatures if they're not playing tribal. If it's tribal versus tribal and you play this and they get to call their tribe as well, it's going to be hurting. But when you can play this and they're not playing tribal and they maybe get two or three creatures back and you maybe get back 10 or 15, it's huge. Twilight's Call, another mass res spell. Six cost. Um, everyone reses all their creatures. If I pay an extra two, I can do it at instant speed. I like it a lot. Um, it's it's really good in conjunction with my Grave Pact and my Dictate to be able to... They may res all their creatures, but when I start sacrificing mine, it's just going to hurt them a lot when they have to sacrifice all their creatures. And then we have Rise of the Dark Realms. This is a nine cost. Um, put all creature cards from all graveyards onto the battlefield under my control. Great spell, late game, helps me win. That's that's pretty much why it's in here. It's more of just a, a win card. Uh, that, you know, that's all my sorceries. Not really a lot going on there. This is a pretty creature-heavy deck. That's really what it's, it's focused around for the most part. Um, another category I'm going to go over now that I sort of forgot about was my uh, my non-basic lands. So I only run a few. I run Shizo's Death Storehouse. Gives target legendary creature fear until end of turn or attach for a black. Now, my general does give all my rats fear, so he gives fear to himself. I have uh, only one other legendary creature in here. Well, actually, I have I have one other legendary creature in the deck, but I have two of the flip rats that can become legendary. So, it, it could give a couple of my guys fear if I don't have Marinara down, but I can also use this politically. I can give one of my opponent's creatures fear if they're attacking into another opponent, and I could essentially inadvertently kill a player with this. But you Kabog, Exiles of Graveyard, pretty standard stuff. <laughs> Cabal Coffers, since I had mono black, it would be silly not to play this, but I tap this into other lands to get a black for each swamp I control. Really, really good. Swarm Yard is awesome in this deck because it can tap for one colorless, that's whatever, or I can tap to generate target insect, rat, spider, or squirrel. Of all my creatures, only three of them are not rats. So it really can regenerate a lot of my creatures. And being able to do it for one mana, essentially, because I'm just tapping the one land, nice. Very, very nice. It's something that not a lot of uh, not a lot of decks will have access to or regenerate for almost for free. Vesuva, uh, more or less meant to really copy my Swarm Yard, all my Cabal Coffers, and my Reliquary Trial for an infinite hand size. So those are my non-basics. Again, not a lot really going on there. Now I'm going to get on to my artifacts. I run a Sensei Divine on top. You know, it's a pretty staple card for artifacts. I run Alter the Brood. Alter the Brood is a heavy hitter with Marinara. Late game when I'm making 10 plus rats and I'm milling every opponent for 10 or 20 or 30, it really, really hits hard. It's really, really nice. <laughs> Alter of Dementia is along the same vein as Alter the Brood. But this, I just sacrifice a creature to this, and it mills equal to their power. So I tap Marinara, make 10 one, one rats, sacrifice 10 of them, I mill you for 10. Really, really nice. It's a late game win card. <coughs> Excuse me. Thornbite Staff really combos well with Marinara because they go infinite together just on their own. Um, the way this works is the equipped creature can pay two, tap, deal some damage, whatever. That's irrelevant for me. I don't really ever use that. But where it really shines is whenever a creature dies, I get to untap the equipped creature. And Marinara has a built-in sacrifice when he taps. So I tap, I sacrifice a creature, he immediately untaps. Really, really nice for this. Nim Death Mantle, super underrated equipment, I think, uh, because it comes with a res on a stick. So it's two-cost artifact. I can give the equipped creature plus two plus two, becomes black and a zombie. That's whatever, whatever. And it gets Intimidate. Again, that's not really important for me. What really is important is that I can keep, I can cast this, keep it on the board, let's let it sit there, and what will happen is when one of my creatures dies, if I have four free mana, I can res them instantly with this back to the board. That is huge, just letting it sit there, because the opponents have to look at it and they have to play around your mana. And being able to force an opponent to play not a way they want to play is how you win games. And we have Illusionist Bracers, let me copy, uh, it's a two cost, three to equip, and whenever you activate an activated ability of, a, of the equipped creature, you copy that ability. Very nice with Marinara. Uh, very nice with a lot of the creatures in my deck. I have a lot of activated abilities. So this card really comes in handy. Umber Mantle is awesome. A three to cast, zero to equip. I can pay three to untap the equipped creature. So that's really nice with Marinara. When I tap him, sacrifice a rat to get five or six rats. 
pay three and untap him and then do it again. And I can just start producing a lot of rats very quickly based on the amount of mana I have. Very, very nice. <laughs> Ashnod's Altar. Sacrifice a creature, get two mana. Really, really cool. Thousand Year Elixir lets me use my tap abilities. Almost, well, to, to break it down, it almost gives your creatures like a pseudo haste. Um, they can't attack, but they can use all their tapped abilities or all their activated abilities when they normally couldn't. So, like I said, it's sort of like a pseudo haste. We have Rings of Bright Hearth. Two cost. Whenever I activate an activity, activated ability, excuse me, I can pay two to copy the ability. Uh, you know, you can see I really, really like to copy the abilities. Really gets a lot of value out of my creatures. <laughs> and we have Door of Destinies. Four cost. When this comes into play, choose a creature type. Whenever I cast a creature, or whenever I cast a card of the chosen creature type, I can put a counter on, a charge counter on this, and all my creatures of that type get a plus one, plus one for every charge counter on this. So I'll cast this for four, I'll call rats, I'll cast a rat and then another rat. So now I've cast two rats, this gets two charge counters, all my rats gets plus two, plus two. Uh, when it first comes down, not very prominent, not very powerful, but once you've cast four or five spells, and your guys are now huge, it, it's sort of a big deal. I run Nightmare Lash and I run Lash Rise. They're more or less the same card for the most part. They both cost four. They uh, both cost either life to equip. This costs three life to equip. This can cost two mana or four life to equip. Uh, this one's a living weapon. That doesn't really matter. What they both do is they both give my creature a plus one, plus one for every swamp I control. And I put them in here solely because I'm playing mono black and it can really let some of my small, small, weak rats help push through. That's the only reason they're in here is just to make my guys a little bigger. We have a Conjurer's Closet, 5 cost, artifact at the end of your turn or at the beginning of your end step. You can blink out a creature you control and then uh, it comes back into play. So it lets me reuse my comes into play abilities, stuff like that. Pretty nice. Cryptic Gateway, this is another one of those cards that if you're playing a tribal deck, you really need to run. Five cost artifact, obviously it's old, it's got the old frame, the old brown artifact frame, sort of ugly. What it does though is I can tap two untapped creatures I control and put a creature card from my hand into play that shares a type with those. So I can tap a rat and a rat and to put a rat into play. That's what I usually use it for. You can get kind of tricky. You know, you could tap an elf and you could tap a warrior to put an elf warrior into play. But I just tap two rats and put a rat into play. It's, it's really nice when I start getting down a lot of tokens and I can just start burning through the cards in my hand. <clears throat> then I play both Gauntlet of Power and Cage Sun for the mana doubling. Uh, they both come down. They both choose a color. They both give the creatures plus one, plus one of that color, and they both double the mana. No real big deal. They have nothing really to talk about. And my last artifact is Argentum Armor. Six costs, six to equip. Gives the equipped creature plus six, plus six. So it's another artifact... <clears throat> It's really going to help my guys sort of push through and put in that extra damage. But why it's really in here is because when the Equip Creature attacks, I can destroy target permanent. That's huge for black because I can't destroy artifacts and I can't destroy enchantments or planeswalkers. So to be able to deal with those things is super helpful. A lot of times this is one of the cards I'll tutor for more so than some other things solely because I will be able to deal with permanents that I could not normally deal with. So that about wraps up my artifacts. <laughs> Next thing I'm going to go with my, is my creatures, and then after my creatures, I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, my uh, combos that I have, some synergies that work really well together. So for now, we're just going to talk about the creatures. You'll notice that a lot of these creatures are sort of subpar. They're, they're not that great. Um, it's just what you get when you have tribal rats. There's not a lot of good options, but the deck can win, and it, it does win you know, pretty effectively. So... Now I'll just talk about the creatures and you'll see more or less <laughs> what I have to deal with here. <laughs> so first we have Typhoid Rat, one cost, one one with Death Touch, very basic. Next we have Nozumi Grave Robber. He's really, really good. I've, I've loved this card ever since he was released back in Kamigawa. He's a flip card, so I'll go over both sides. I can His, his first side when he comes in, he's a two cost, two one, whatever. I can pay two and remove a card from a graveyard from the game. That's awesome. Uh, that I can just start picking off cards out of your graveyard. Boom, boom, boom. Those cards are gone. Now, if I use his ability on an empty graveyard, he flips. When he flips, he becomes Night Eyes the Desecrator, becomes legendary, and becomes a 4-2. And he has a new ability. He loses his first ability. He gains a new one to be able to tap 5 and put target creature card in a graveyard into play under my control. 
so that more or less essentially start resing my creatures, my opponent's creatures, anyone's creatures. Doesn't even matter. Doesn't matter at all. A lot of times though, I won't flip him. I'll just keep him as the his original version and just keep hitting the cards out of their graveyard. Because once he flips, I lose that ability. So a lot of times, like I said, I'll just keep on using that two mana to get rid of a card, get rid of a card, get rid of a card, and won't ever flip him. Up next we have Ravenous Rats. Two cost, one one. When they come into play, ta uh, target opponent discards a card. <coughs> Pretty basic. It does what it does, and it does it well. So that's why I play it in there. And we have Nazumi Bone Reader. Two cost, one one. Pay one, sacrifice a creature, target play, discards a card, play it only as a sorcery. This is nice when I start getting down tons and tons of uh, Marinara rat tokens. I can really use this to, uh, you know, start shredding people's hands. Five or six mana late in the game to shred someone's hand is, is a good deal to me. Skull Snatcher, one of the ninjutsu rats here, two cost, two one, rat ninja. When Skull Slasher deals combat, when Skull Snatcher deals combat damage to a player, remove up to two target cards in that player's graveyard from the game. So when he hits, I can exile two cards. Pretty basic what he does. I really have him in there for that ninjutsu effect because I can attack with one of my rats that has a, a comes into play ability, and when they go unblocked, I will ninjutsu him in, return them to my hand, and now I can reuse their comes into play ability, and that to me is pretty huge. Rotting Rats, another 2 cost, 1-1. One, one. When he comes into play, everybody discards a card, and he has Unearth. Don't generally use the Unearth because I don't want him to be exiled, but when he comes into play, everybody discards a card. Hurts me a little bit, but I'll take it. And we have Nizumi Shorefang, another one of my Flip Rats. He is a 2 cost, 1-1, one, one, and he has, for a 1 to black tap, target player discards a card. Uh, then if that player has no cards in his hand, Flip Nizumi Shorefang. So he's another one where he flips once he does something cool. What he does is they discard a card. If they discard their last card and they no longer have a card, he flips. When he flips, he becomes Stab Whisker the Odious. And he becomes a 3-3 and he's a legendary creature rat shaman. And then he gets, his ability changes from discard to at the, at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, that player loses one life for each card in his hand fewer than three. The way that works is if they have three cards in their hand, nothing happens. If they have zero cards in their hand, they lose three life. If they have two cards in their hand, they lose one life. You know, it, it seems like a small amount of damage, but it does add up rather quickly. And I have won games just off him because people don't realize how effective he becomes. I mean, after three turns, you've lost nine life because I can keep your hand empty. You know, I, I really can. And it's just one of those things that, that I'll do it if I can. <clears throat> Then we have Pack Rat, very well known. He was huge and standard, but two cost, XX Rat, or Star Star rather. His power and toughness is equal to the number of rats I control. That's huge for this deck. I have a ton, a ton of rats in here. And he also has uh, two mana and a black. Discard a card, put a token to play. It's a copy of him. <laughs> I've used that a couple times to make two or three of them. I'm not huge on the discard part, but if I can set it up with one of my res rats or something like that, then I will, I will surely do that. Then we have up uh, here, Kuro's Taken. He is a 2 cost, 1-1 one, one with Bushido 1 and Regenerate. He's in there solely for the Regenerate. He makes a good blocker, so he just kind of hangs out. Crypt Rats. Crypt Rats is really nice. Uh, he deals X damage to each creature and each player, and I can spend only black mana. The spending only black mana is fine because I'm mono black. Uh, he's really, really nice. If someone gets to a point where they have lower health than me, he really just becomes a ticking bomb. If I'm at 20 life and they're at 10, I'll spend the 10 mana and kill them. I, why not? Why wouldn't I if I'm not going to die? Uh, next up we have Stab, uh, sorry, Death Mask Nizumi. Death Mask Nizumi is a 3 cost, 2-2 two, two, Rat Shaman. As long as you have 7 more cards in your hand, he gets plus 2, plus 1 and has fear. You know, again, he's just one of the, the more janky rats that I sort of just have in there because I don't really have a lot of choice for rats, but... He, he can do the job. He can get him for some damage. Another one of the sort of janky rats here is Nizumi Ronin. Three cost, 3-1 uh, with Bushido 1. That's it. Pretty basic. <coughs> Disease Vermin. This is a cute little card. I really like it. He's a three cost, 1-1. One, one. He has a lot of text on there, so I'll read it. During your upkeep, Disease Vermin deals one damage to a single target opponent. It has previously damaged for each infection counter on Disease Vermin. If Disease Vermin... Damages a player in combat, put an infection counter on it. 
It sounds a little confusing, so I'll break it down for the way he works. Disease vermin attacks you. If he hits you, he gets a counter on him, a disease counter. Or is that what is a disease counter or a plague counter? Oh, sorry, an infection counter. I was wrong either way. So he gets an infection counter on him. Now, because he's hit you at the beginning of my upkeep, I can hit you with him for one because he has one infection counter on him. So I will. I'll hit you for an additional one. Then next turn, what I'll do is I'll attack somebody else. He, get, he gets another infection counter on him. So now he has two infection counters on him. Now on my upkeep, I can choose to deal damage to either of those players with two damage. So it's another one of those things he kind of just sits there and lingers and, and pings away at you. I've had him deal quite a, quite a bit of damage when he gets up to you know, four or five infection counters and he's hitting you for five damage a turn just for free. It's not bad at all. <coughs> Scrib Nibblers. This guy. This guy right here, Scrib Nibblers. This guy. Underrated. Super underrated in my opinion. Three cost, one, one. Tap him to exile the top card of Target Player's Library. If it's a land card, I gain one life. That's pretty cool. Exile the top card of your library. I like that a lot. And he has landfall. Whenever land enters the battlefield under my control, I get to untap him. So if it's, it's my turn and I draw a land and I want to play it, I'll tap him to exile a card, then play the land he untaps. Pass to you. At the end of your turn, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exile another card from the top of your library. Really, really not bad. Chittering Rats, 3 cost 2-2. Two, two. When Chittering Rats comes into play, target opponent puts a card from the hand on top of the library. This is a part of sort of a soft, well, not really a soft lock. It's sort of a hard lock that I can get onto someone to sort of, uh, you know, just lock them out of the game. It's it's really nice. Disease carries. He's pretty cool. Four cost two two. When he's put into a graveyard from the battlefield, target creature gets minus two minus two on the tenor. Basically, I'll block with him. He'll do two damage. He'll die. He'll give a creature a minus two minus two. So he can kill anything up to a four four in combat, which is really nice for a two two being able to do that. Or I could block and kill a two two, then put the negative two negative two on another guy and two for one the opponent. It's really a, a nice thing to be able to do. Then we have Ogre Slumlord. He's one of my few non-rats. Whenever another rat creature, uh, whenever another non-token creature dies, I may put a one-one black rat token into play. So whenever one of my non-token rats dies, I can get a uh, a one-one rat. Uh, but it's either, it's it's even just when anything dies. It doesn't say mine. So whenever another non-token creature dies, I may put a rat into play. So if something dies on my opponent's side. I get a token. If something dies on my side, I get a token. And he gives all my rats a death touch. Super, super nice. <laughs> like, really, really is. Very nice. And we have Throat Slitter. 5 cost 2-2 two, two at Ninjutsu. I already talked about why I love Ninjutsu, that I can reuse my comes into play abilities. What his ability is when he hits is that when Throat Slitter deals combat damage to a player, destroy target non-black uh, non creature that, play that, that player controls. Uh, it's a little kill spell on a body that comes in surprisingly. I really like it. And we have Okiba Gang Shinobi, more or less the exact same thing as Throat Sitter, except when he deals damage, the opponent discards two cards rather than getting a creature killed. Not a lot to talk about there. <coughs> but the big the big ninja rat is this one, Ink Eyes, uh, Ink Eyes Servant of Oni. Six cost, five, four. She has the ninjutsu. I already said why I love it. She has the ability, though, when she, when she hits the opponent, I can res a creature from their graveyard for free. That's a huge, huge ability. And then she uh, has regenerate for for two mana, so that's also huge. She is just a monster on the board. You get her down, suit her up with an equipment or two, and she is just an absolute monster. Ratcatcher, six cost four four with fear, so he can get through for some damage on his own. At the beginning of my upkeep, I may tutor for a rat card and reveal it if I do shuff my library. Being able to tutor for the rat I want is is really really helpful, really really nice. Then we have patron of the Nizumi. He's a 7 cost 6-6 six, six with Rat Offering. Rat Offering is a pretty unique ability, obviously, to rats. But it says, you may cast this card anytime you could cast an instant by sacrificing a rat and paying the difference in mana cost between this and the sacrificed rat. Mana cost includes color. So, basically, the way this works is I can sacrifice, say, 5 rats, and then I can cast him for 2 mana instant speed. Or I can cast sacrifice 4 rats and cast him for 3 it's being able to bring him out at instant speed is really nice. His real coup de gras is that whenever a permanent is put into an opponent's graveyard, that player loses one life. You know that's really, really a good ability. He can just sit down there, and if I cast, if, if I've down him down and cast a sweeper, and they lose 15 creatures, they're gonna lose 15 life as well. And it's lo uh, loss of life, not damage, so it's harder to prevent. You can't really prevent it at all for the most part. 
So yeah, that's my uh, my big patron of the Nozumi. And then I run Rune Sky Demon for the obvious point of he's a demon. He uh, he is flying. He's seven cost six six. He's big, and he tutors for a card when he comes in. So that's that's really really nice. <clears throat> you know, I sort of justified it to myself. For me, everything had to have a justification. It had to make sense for my theme. And in the lore for Marinara, he sort of sold his soul to a demon for the most part to get his power. You know, to get the po the mystical power he has. So in my crazy, whacked up, messy head, he's the he's the demon that Marinara sold his soul to to get the power. Then I have, you know, something like this. This makes sense for a rat deck. deck. This makes sense for a rat deck. Uh, you know, they all make sense for a rat deck. And that was important to me when building the, the, the theme deck. So that more or less wraps up all the cards. Now I'm going to quickly go over some combos and some synergies I have. Uh, a nice little synergy I have together is these right here. Ogre, Slumlord, and Crypt Rats. Uh, because Ogre Slumlord gives all my rats uh, Death Touch, I can just take my Crypt Rats, invest one mana, and it's going to kill everything. Just going to kill every single creature. And for every creature that it killed, I'm going to get a 1-1 one, one Black Rat token. So I have my Ogre Slumlord down, I have my Crypt Rats down, and I invest just one mana, you know. I put one mana into Crypt Rats. Let's say he kills 15 creatures. Now these two die. So 15 other creatures died. These two died. That makes 17. That means I'm going to get 17 rat tokens for more or less one mana and a sweeper. That's that's a really nice two card synergy that I have there. Then this is a nice little synergy I have as well. So once I get Nizumi Shortfang flipped into Stabwisk of the Odious... I can use Nizumi Bone Reader to continuously make them discard their cards and stay down to that zero cards every turn. You know, on my turn, I'll make them discard a card, so at their turn, at the beginning of their upkeep, they have to take that three loss of lice, uh, lice, uh, life. rather. So that's a real nice synergy that I have with these two cards. <coughs> Another nice little synergy I have is with Nizumi Grave Robber. Once I exile enough cards and I get him flipped to be able to res... When he's on Night Eyes the Desecrator, what I can do is I can use my Disease Carrier to instant speed res him as a blocker. Uh, so I'll block, he'll die, and I'll give the creature a minus two, minus two. So he sits in my graveyard, and then the next turn when they go to attack again, I can pay the five, res him again, block, give something a minus two, minus two. So he can really use some, uh, some real nice combat tricks to take guys out. Then also, he combos well with Pack Rat. You know, with Pack Rat, I pay three, I pitch a card. Let's say I pitch my Scrib Nibbler. Doesn't really matter. So, I pay three with Pack Rat, I pitch a card, and I get a copy of Pack Rat. That's pretty cool. But now I have this creature in my graveyard. So, I'll pay the five with him to res it. So, you know, it really lets me sort of more freely pick the cards I want to pitch to Pack Rat to be able to res them with Night Eyes. And those really synergize well together. And one of the last things I have here is this soft lock right here. It, it does require a sack outlet, so I could add in, say, my Nozumi Bone Reader as a sack outlet or my Ashnod's Altar as a sack outlet. But what I do is I have him down flipped, and I have either, uh, either one of these down. It doesn't really matter which one it is, as long as I have one of these two down. And I cast my Chittering Rats. And if they only have one card in their hand, they have to put that card back on top of their library. So then I... Pass turn to them. At the beginning of their upkeep, I will sacrifice my Chittering Rats to my Ashnod's Altar. If I didn't have Ashnod's Altar, uh, at my second main phase, I would sacrifice it to Bone Reader since it's Sorcery, so he's in my graveyard. So, you know, Chittering Rats is now dead. And what I have on the board is is either one of these on my turn, doesn't matter, and Night Eyes the Desecrator. Then what I do is, once they've drawn their card and they pass priority to me, I'm going to pay my five, I'm going to res Chittering Rats. They now have to put a card on top of their library. So unless it's a, a land that they can play without the stack or an instant, if then they're they're locked out of the game at that point. Because if all they had was a creature or an artifact enchantment or a planeswalker that doesn't have flash, then they have to put that card back on top of the library, and I can do that whole process again next turn. So for five mana or six mana, I can lock someone out of the game. And once I have someone locked out of the game, I can devote all my other resources to taking out somebody else. So it's Really, really a nice little thing that I can pull off. <clears throat> Let's see, what else? Uh, then I have Marinari, sort of a machine on his own. 
And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over why that is and, and the things I can do with him. So what I can do with Marinar is, as I said, is giving him Thornbite Staff, he goes infinite. So what it does require to really go infinite is I need at least Marinar and two other rats. I put these cards face down because the rats they are literally doesn't matter. Any two other rats will work fine. So what I'll do is I'll tap Marinara, I sacrifice a rat. Because a, because a creature just died, he instantly untaps. Now, the ability checks and sees, oh, I have two rats, so I get two rats into play. So I've gone up one rat, now I have, instead of having three, now I have four. <clears throat> and I can do it again. Tap him, sacrifice a rat. Because a rat died, he instantly untaps because of Thornbite Staff. Now I have three rats, so I get three more tokens. So you see how that can get out of hand very, very quickly with just those two cards. So then what I can do is, assuming I have this little machine going, I'm going to put these off to the side because they, they don't really relevant anymore. You know that I can go infinite with just those. If I add in Altar of the Brood, I now have infinite mill right there. You know, infinite mill at that point, just with that. So every time I tap him and I get those rats, which, which will get bigger and bigger every turn, my opponents have to mill for that many. So I can slide Altar of the Brood off to the side. If I have Altar of Dementia, it's more or less the exact same thing. Tap him, make a bunch of rats. He'll untap, make a bunch more rats. He'll untap, make a bunch more rats. Once I have like a hundred or so rats, I can sacrifice them all to Altar of Dementia and mill you out. Then what I can also do is if I have down Grave Pact, I can, every time I make a rat and I have to sacrifice a rat, that will trigger Grave Pact and my opponents have to sacrifice. So he'll untap, I get a bunch of rats, but they've lost a creature. Now I can do that as many times as it takes to make them sacrifice all of their creatures and that will get around indestructible as well, which is really nice. Then I can add in my Dictated Verbos, so they have to do two at a time or just swap it out for either one. You know, that I can kill as many creatures as I need to that way. Then if I add in this right here, my altar, um, Ashnod's altar, I can sacrifice a rat for two mana. So, you know, anytime I want to, I can just get infinite colorless mana. Pretty nice. And then what I can also do is my, my pet little card here, Scrib Nibblers. If I have Scrib Nibbler down with Umbral Mantle, what I can do here is I can tap Scrib Nibbler to exile a card. Then I can tap Marinaw to make a bunch of rats. I can sacrifice a bunch of those rats for mana because a creature died, he'll untap. All I have to really do is sacrifice two rats. Once I sacrifice two rats and I have four mana, I can use the ability of my Umbral Mantle, use three of it to untap my Scrib Nibblers, tap him again to exile cards, make some rats, he'll untap, sacrifice the rats for mana, use the mana to untap him, and I have infinite exile. So as you can see, I, I have so many things I can do, so many just crazy, insane things that I can pull off. And it's, it's sort of like a machine where it's, you know, you have the one part that operates the machine, but you can add an accessory for mana or an accessory for in instant kill or an accessory for in infinite, ex uh, infinite mill or another one for infinite mill or another two card combo for infinite mill. The things that I can do are, are really, really just really cool. And I don't necessarily need Thorn by Staff. I can go infinite with just Umbral Mantle, as long as I have down enough rats. So as long as I have down, I think I think I need like five rats. So I tap him, I sacrifice one rat, so I go down to four, so I get four rats. Sacrifice two of those rats to my Ashnod's altar, I'll get four mana to untap him. So I still net one mana every time. Now I went from four, from five rats, sacrifice down to four. Uh, so then when his ability resolves, I go to eight. Minus two, I go to six. Then I use his ability again. And I will go from six down to five, five to ten. Sacrifice two to go to eight. Untap him. So it, the, the number of rats will still grow. But every time he untaps, he gets a plus two, plus two. And he has fear. So once I get him up to enough, enough uh, power, I can just one-shot someone. One-shot him with commander damage. So I can one-shot someone with commander damage. You know, someone might see him and be like, oh, he's a 12-turn clock or an 11-turn clock. You know, to do command damage. But I can come out of nowhere and just one-shot someone. So, I mean, as you can see by the cards I've gone over, I have so many little, you know, nuances and little tricks I can pull off with so many different cards that it's not like I always have the same win strategy. Sometimes I went through 
overwhelming wrath. Sometimes I went through tokens. I can went through mill. I can went through exile. Anything I want to do, I can really do it. And that's that's more or less how this deck wins. It's it's almost like a mono black tribal rat toolbox of however I'd like to win. But yeah, that about sums up the deck and everything it can do. So uh, I'd like to thank you for watching the video if you watched the whole thing. And I'd like to say, you know, it would be great if you could like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think about my Marinara deck. If you'd like tips on building one, if you've ever seen one, if you've played against one. Yeah, let me know. Like, comment, and subscribe, and thanks a lot.